Hello and welcome back to Rebound with Resilience, a podcast dedicated to raise your resilience, mindset and mental wellness. And on today's episode, I'm joined by uh, Jenny Teo. Jenny, hi. I appreciate you having on the show. Thank you for having me, Kevin. Hi. Hello. Allow me to just introduce you and, and the outline of the podcast before we begin. Yeah, so uh, this month is Mental Health Awareness Month. I thought it would be worthwhile to conclude this month by speaking about it in depth from lived experiences. And I hope that this episode can help viewers uh, get some perspective on how to help somebody in need or to urge you to seek help if needed. Yeah, I'm joined by, by Jenny Teo. She's one of the founder, uh, co-founders of Please Stay Movement. It's a movement that was started by a group of mothers who lost their children to suicide. In the midst of their grief and pain, they found the strength to come together to advocate for suicide prevention and more support for children at risk of self-harm. Uh, she also runs Stigma to Strength, an in- initiative that aims to apply a more unconventional approach of addressing the topic of suicide and other stigmas from a perspective of lived experiences, right? combining both evidence and research-based narratives and research um, to present certain information across. So yes, yeah, so today's outline, uh, we're just going to hear from Jenny's experiences and also discuss the topic of uh, youth mental health. Yeah, so Jenny, uh, thank you once again for, for being here. And also, I must say that I'm very appreciative of, you know, I've seen some of the videos that uh, of other channels that you were sharing your story. And, and it has, uh, I just, I know, you, I know you probably get this a lot, but I just want to still say that I'm appreciative and um, grateful that you are doing the work we are doing. And I think it's very necessary. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I that's my purpose in life right now. I'm very passionate about doing anything mm. that can help save lives. Sure. Okay. So, um, yeah. So I would just like to ask, uh, just a, a bit about your story. Um, I know, uh, Josh. You know, when he was growing up, like, what was your relationship with him like, and how was he like? Uh, as a kid, as a student growing up? Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> Josh was a really, really fun fun kid to have around. Mm. Uh, he was always cracking jokes, uh, trying to make me laugh. Mm. Um, and like, you know, he liked to play pranks. And um, I really enjoyed being a mother to him. Um, I called him my Mr. Bean. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> um, Yeah, I I really enjoy doing things, you know, teaching him how to ride a bicycle, how to swim, uh, and fetching him around for his uh, classes and all that. Yeah, so I really enjoyed um, my my role as I used to call myself a human development officer. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So um, just, uh, you know, what what are some... Um, what are some things that he enjoyed doing? You know, in- he well, he is. Uh, I think he's got my genes because mm. uh, I'm I'm pretty creative. Okay. Uh, so he, I think he's got my genes there. So, growing up, you know, when he was like eight, nine years old, he would carry around his own movie camera, okay. and he would make his own movies, uh, and he would put uh, sound effects, you know, visual effects, and all that in his movies, and he would uh, get me and the domestic helper to be his uh, actresses <laughs> and his friends as well, you know. So he would do the sound, he would, you know, he would act as well. So he's like all in one. Uh, that was uh, something that he really, really loved doing. Sure. Uh, yeah, so, and, and uh, he loved, uh, we used to go bowling as well. Mm. Um, and I think because of his uh, passion in uh, making movies and everything, mm. so Naturally, he loved going to the cinema. Okay. So every Thursday, I think when they launch a new uh, movie, uh, he would be there in the theater. Every Thursday. Uh, yeah. Every Almost every. Wow. Mm. Okay. It's quite yeah. dedicated. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, so. Uh, apart from that, uh, he enjoyed uh, gaming as well. So uh, and he was. Uh, studying games design and development in ITE. Mm. Okay. Yeah. 
people in gaming, you know, they, they have the programming and they have the uh, coming up with the creative landscape. Yes, and yeah, so, for sure. The yeah, coding. the creative one, he was always doing the creative part. He wow. was doing the okay. programming part, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I recently saw a, a video of Japanese game developers and it's very, it's not easy to program a game and the creative aspects of it. I think he must have been quite passionate or good in what he did, for sure. Um, could, could I ask, um, when, when did that also lead to, you know, in his work and in his endeavors, right? What were some sources of stress that he might have faced? I, I think we did discuss this and you shared that uh, it was a journey. It was a journey and, and at certain points there were struggles with his mental health because he didn't stress this. Um, could I ask what those stresses were potentially? Um, I think growing up, uh, he had um, what what we call in the you know when mental health is concerned, uh, ACE, which is adverse childhood experience. Mm. Um, I think his father's parenting style was quite different from mine. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I think. Also because uh, his father was working overseas, posted overseas. So he, he only saw his father like once a week. Mm. Um, so I think uh, there was a lot of adjustment and all that to the parenting style between me and the father. Mm. Um, and so there were episodes. Uh, I think one was uh, when he was just a couple of months before PSLE. Mm. Uh, where I was still at work and um, I think his father was not very happy with his results um, and um, uh, you know uh, he was subject to to uh, the father's parenting style uh, and I think it affected him quite a bit um, and then subsequently uh, he fell sick after that Mm. And then um, he didn't want to go to school. He didn't want to attend yeah. class. So he ended up uh, seeing, uh, going to the child guidance clinic. Okay. Um, yeah. And he was uh, diagnosed as having anxiety disorder. So mm. uh, a few months, so he didn't go to school uh, a few months before he set for his PSLE. Mm. Uh, he, went, he went to school, but he went to the counselor's office. He didn't attend class. So naturally, I think he didn't do quite well. Uh, in his results. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think after that episode, I seem to notice that his behavior had changed quite a bit. Uh, he was a lot more introverted. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, just after the that episode, he was hiding behind sofas, hiding in wardrobe. Uh, his whole personality just took, you know, a 360 degree turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and um, he lost the motivation to study when he entered secondary school. So I had to quit my job to uh, make sure that, you know, uh, I support him in his academic studies. Mm. So I was, you know, apart from fetching him around for his tuition, I also had to help him, uh, you know, in, in other, other subjects because he literally had no motivation to study at all. Mm. That, that period must have been difficult for you because, it's, I mean, I do do uh, speak to students in schools and some of them lack the motivation to study and they do, it's hard to find meaning in, in what they do. How, how were some of the ways you helped him to find meaning in his work? Um, because you mentioned about game design. And was there those things that you, you did share with him that in future you could do these things? Uh, well, actually, game design came uh, a lot later. When he was okay. in school, um, he always flunked maths. Mm. Uh, he was good in, in subjects like English, geography. Okay. Uh, but when it came to Chinese and, and you know, maths and science, he was, you know, he just couldn't, couldn't handle it. Okay. But I was glad that I found him a very, very good maths teacher mm. who uh, was pretty un unorthodox in the way he taught mm. um, and not only that I think he became Josh's mentor in that sense mm. so Josh was uh, very motivated so uh, I was surprised uh, when he got his results for his end level sec mm -hmm. four uh, he got a distinction for maths oh, from wow. to distinction <laughs> yeah. yeah 
Yeah, for math. So, and and he did very well for his science as well, you know, right. and to another very good science uh, tuition teacher. Uh, so I think um, when kids are during that age, right, uh, in secondary school, where they, are, they, they find it very challenging, you know, with the subjects, you know, because, I mean, there are lots of subjects. And, you know, I, I was surprised that, you know, some of the things they have to learn, you know, which yeah. during my time, I didn't have to yeah. even study all those things. Mm. So I think it can be very, very stressful for the child. And um, so a good mentor in, 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 you know, in the form of a, a, a good tuition teacher, mm. I think helps a lot because sure. I think at this time kids really need a, a, a good role model yeah. Yeah, to okay. motivate them. Yeah. Okay, for sure. And so I, have to, I, think I understand that he you know, did well enough to go into, uh, of course, pursue one of his passions in game design and also went to army i believe he went to, to ns as well actually uh josh uh, when he finished his n level mm. he uh the cutoff point to get to direct poly program mm. was uh 11. Okay. he got 12. Mm. he got 12. and there was no way that we could appeal so mm. and he didn't want to do secondary five so, uh, and because he, he did well enough to go into higher NITEC, so he decided, you know, to, to then go to ITE. So he did higher right. NITEC in games design. Right. And then when he uh, finished his, um, his uh, uh, course there, he missed again uh, by 0.03% mm. to get into, uh, you know, direct, direct uh, the poly program as well. So he missed twice actually. Um, and then uh, for some reason, um, there was during this time also, there was a lot of uh, situation at home uh, that wasn't very conducive uh, because you know his father and I were going through a divorce and all that. Uh, and then he also had uh, you know, his first experience in a relationship mm. and the girl broke up with him. Uh, so this period of, you know, his ITE years uh, mm. wasn't very good. Uh, you know, he was very um, um, disappointed in a sense that he couldn't get into the poly. Uh, he wanted to take uh, a TV production in poly, mm. but he couldn't get in. So he ended up in, uh, in a private educational institution. And he was very disappointed with that, um, you know, um, and then finally, after his course, it was a decision whether to, what, what to do. So he decided to, to just serve his NS first. Okay. So he got enlisted uh, in 2017. Yeah. Sure. And um, I think uh, at that time, his uh, girlfriend already broken up with him. Uh, and he was really uh, very affected by it. But at the time also, because after the divorce, I also went into depression. Mm. So I couldn't support him either. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, during that time also, his, while he was in the army, uh, he, he, 2017 was a very bad year for him, you know, okay. in, in terms of the stress, uh, you know, a series of sure. events for him, you know, in the sense that uh, he had to, um, he had to uh, manage the, you know, the, um, the home environment. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, face a lot of new uh, experiences going to NS. Mm. And then uh, was also having a lot of relationship issues with his girlfriend. Mm. Uh, yeah. So it was a very stressful time, you know, and, and at the same time, his father wanted him to go overseas uh, after his mm. NS, um, but he didn't want to um, because he was already in depression then and sure. he didn't want to, uh, you know, leave, leave uh, and, and go such to, to such a far away place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think all these things um, just kind of like, you know, added up. I wasn't able to support him, so he felt that he didn't have the support, you know, and he lost his uh, his he broke up with his girlfriend. So, yeah, so all these things just kind of like all overwhelmed him. And I think mm. he just got worse, mm. uh, even having seen a psychiatrist and seeking treatment. 
Okay. Uh, so when um, his girlfriend, uh, you know, uh, finally decided to uh, end it off with him the second time, mm. uh, that was in December 2017, okay. two months after he uh, attempted the first time. Yeah. Okay. But uh, God preserved him. Um, but uh, then, then during the four months after that, I thought he was actually getting better. Because uh, he, in order to cope, he uh, was just, you know, it, it, very, very much into computer gaming. Mm. And, but he was laughing and all that while he was playing with his friends in the virtual world. So I actually thought he was actually getting better. But mm. um, unfortunately, um, uh, I think his computer crashed twice. And uh, there was a point where he just felt very burnt out. Mm. And I think that was when he started to think about a lot of things, you know, about his breakup and all that. And uh, so and that was around May, June. Mm. Um, and uh, I think um, during the month of June, Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade also took their lives mm. uh, in the first week of June. And um, mm. a week later, Josh told his friends that even the celebrities do it. And then um, that that's about round about the same time he actually tested mm. tested his girlfriend, okay. um, and uh, he he was hoping I think for perhaps a reconciliation, but uh, I think the response he got was uh, really totally uh, devastated him, and um, and also I think uh, the response was 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 very callous in a sense. Uh, I felt, even as a mother, I felt the pain mm. and I could understand exactly how, you know, heartbroken he was. So I think that the breakup was actually the last straw on the camel's back for him. Uh, he was already so overwhelmed with so many things going on in his life. Um, and I think it really hit him hard. Uh, he, he already saw, you know, his parents, you know, breaking up and then now he's breaking, you know, his girlfriend broke up with him. So I think there is a lot of a uh, sense of um, lack of belongingness, you know, okay. as well as um, a sense of burdensomeness as well, mm. you know, and then of course he's being exposed to, you know, the suicides of Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade. Sure. So all the three uh, things that you know if you do some research into suicides you know uh, it actually is a uh, these are the three things that that sets the 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 desire for the person to okay. want to end, it, uh, to end the pain yeah so so as you know as I'm, uh, I'm I'm still you know I have a lot of questions still sure and, you know that's the reason why I went to research to find mm -hmm. the answer because I know that I cannot go and I cannot walk into a doctor's uh, clinic, mm. you know, and find the answers uh, because there are just so many uh, re reasons, so many causes, so many factors, you know, that contribute yeah. to his mental state. So, um, but I'm slowly finding the answers as I'm doing the research, um, e even on the topic of the teenage brain and things like that. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I think that's something that we can talk about a little bit later mm -hmm. in the podcast so that other youth also have awareness of what they're going through. Um, of course, uh, I know it's been, it's been passed for quite some time and you've gone through a process of recovery. Um, I'd like to ask a little bit more about that. When when incident first happened, how was your response to it and how do you slowly heal and this? find that purpose to start Peace Day Movement? Um, me, mm. I think um, there were three main uh, stages that I went through. Mm. Um, and particularly they were the absorption stage, uh, the adjustment stage, and the acceptance stage. Mm. My absorption stage uh, was very, very traumatic. Uh, I, it started when I found him lying on the sofa, uh, in that, on that morning. And, um, 
it was traumatic in the sense that you know you know that uh, looking at him, you know that it's too late. But yet, uh, the SCD, uh, SCDF tells you, you know, that you have to carry his body onto the floor and, you know, press on his chest and count to a hundred, you know. But you already know that it's a futile attempt. But you still go through through it. Um, it was very very tough. Um, I, I still get flashbacks. Um, then of course, you know, when they finally pronounced, uh, pronounced him dead, I, that was when my world fell apart. It totally crashed. Uh, so after that, mm, you know, the other things like identification of the body, cremation, uh, columbarium, and all those things, you know, it was just like going through the motions, but I think that was like the, the worst uh, post-traumatic stress disorder for me. But uh, I th thank God that I was able to heal from there, from, from that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was my absorption stage. Um, um, and then my, my adjustment was when I had to, after that, I, I literally arranged to meet all his friends um, on a one-to-one, -one, face to face. Uh, I just wanted to, to just find out how he was like okay. when he was out with them in school and all that. Um, it was uh, it was like, you know, when you have his friends there and it feels like he's, he's there also. So mm -hmm. I didn't want to let go of that. Um, then I, so during that time also, I moved out from, from, from the house to mm -hmm. an, another place. I think that helped a lot uh, because you, you then don't have to pass the room where you, know, you first found him every time you want to go to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, you know, a lot of things, you know, looking at his, at all the photographs and all that, just trying to recall all the memories. Mm. Then, um, so that was the adjustment stage. Okay. My acceptance stage was when um, I started to uh, do an interview. I did my first interview mm. uh, uh, where I shared about I shared my story and at the time I you know I didn't really I was actually suffering from self-stigma okay. so it was so bad that you know I, I told myself I, I cannot possibly use my real name so I actually I really I use my baptism name okay. uh, so um, but that gave me some sort of a closure mm -hmm. and subsequently I did a talk uh, with Caregivers Alliance uh, to, uh, you know, about 80 caregivers. And that was the first time I actually shared Joshua's story uh, okay. to a live audience. And that somehow gave me, you know, a, a, a complete closure. So okay. after that, that was when I, you know, I, I realized that um, I was healing, uh, you know, I, I was actually getting healed. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Jenny, for sharing your story around the yeah. I know it must must be really difficult every time you recount it. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry that you had to go through it. Uh, I cannot imagine the amount of... I mean, how tough it would be, you know, even when I was going through certain challenges and, and my mom was very... She was very affected by it. Uh, and yeah, I remember the first time I had a suicidal thought as well and... And then she, I, I remember the first person I told was her. So she, she hugged me very tightly, you know. She said, Kevin, don't, don't ever say such a thing. Uh, so I'm, I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. But at the same time, I, I am comforted by the fact that you have found solace and, 
and strength through sharing your story and, and impacting other people and making your purpose to ensure that others, youth and other parents have a better equipped to um, go through their struggles. Uh, I'd like to ask a bit more about that stage because it does really inspire me to see um, you know, the movement that you have started and the amount of people that has helped. So we've, we've, of course you started giving talks and when, when did the Please Stay movement, when did the idea come about and how was it conceived to the point where you executed? Um, okay, that in 2019, after um, they uploaded my first video, Mm. Um, round about that time, I was introduced to this group of uh, suicide bereaved moms. Um, and there were about like around eight to 10 of them, I think. Mm. And, you know, when we talked and all that, and we kind of like, you know, we, we hear each other's stories and all that. And I realized that majority of the moms that I met had actually lo lost their children in the year of 2018, like mm. me. Uh, so my first thought was that the SOS statistics for 2018 would be quite high. Mm. And I was right, um, you know. And then uh, we had this group chat where a mom sent a link to a, an Australian video. Mm. So when I saw the video, uh, I, 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 I was actually, um, I had a kind of like a light bulb moment mm. when I saw the video. Because the video was like, you know, uh, like it was like a, done in a, in, in a way that it was like a letter written to the Australian parliament sure. just to caution them about the, uh, or warn them about the serious teenage crisis in Australia. And it said, we know because we are the parents. Mm -hmm. uh, so I said, you know, immediately I told myself, I said, we got to have a Singapore version. Mm. So that was uh, when I then, um, you know, brought up this idea. And okay. um, I was so passionate about it because I wanted to, you know, I started to gather as many moms as possible. But then uh, from a target of like 10, you know, we only managed to get three who were willing to, to actually appear on video. Okay. Uh, it's not easy because of the no. stigma. Yeah. yeah, so um, then, you know, I also got, um, I got the funding for it. Uh, I tried to get a video production company to do it pro bono. Um, and, you know, and then before we knew it, um, uh, we, the, the video was done okay. and we launched it. Uh, so I, I got my friend who worked in, in, you know, media to, uh, to arrange for an interview, um, and all that. So, uh, so, so we didn't really expect, we only came up with the name after the video. Sure. And we didn't expect it to go viral. But uh, for me, uh, the video was important because what I really wanted to do with the video was to unite the voices of as many mothers as possible. Okay. Uh, and to, to with, with, with unity, there is, uh, there is that power and to, to go out there and say, uh, look, you know, this teenage suicide crisis in Singapore is some, you know, please wake up, you know, it, it, it's a, I wanted to give a wake up call okay. on the gravity of the situation sure. in Singapore. Yeah. So the funny thing was that uh, it, uh, when the video came out, uh, it started a conversation, people started talking um, and uh, it came to a point where somebody said, I didn't know there were so many mm. and that was the impact. I wanted from the video. Uh, so, um, so, 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 uh, so from then on, um, you know, I continued to to front and and to 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 give as many talks as possible and interviews as possible to to give it a voice in that sense. Yeah, understand that. And throughout this process, uh, were, were there people that messaged you? The encouragement were there the personal responses that you received from others? Particularly the one that I did uh, under Zula, there were different groups of people who responded. You know, there's one group, uh, you know, they, they say, uh, oh, you know, thank you for, uh, for this video. Um, we, you know, you have um, 
uh, you have saved my life. Mm. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think you know what I'm talking about. Mm. You know? so, so that's a group of people who respond. Then a second group uh, of people responded with, um, oh, you know, watching your video is like waiting for a nightmare to happen mm. because I have a son who is in depression. Mm. And then there's another group that says, uh, uh, oh, you know, I, I, I understand how you feel. You know, mm. I've lost a child also through suicide. Uh, so there were different, you know, the, the video spoke to different people going through different things, you know, uh, where mental health was concerned, where mm. suicide attempts were concerned. So, okay. uh, yeah, so I... I I, I was shocked as well because uh, it went viral, you know, like mm. it crossed the 500 over thousand mark within like mm. uh, three weeks or four weeks. Yeah, uh, but I, you know, even if 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 I have someone to say I decided not to do it right. after watching the video, that was good enough for me. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that 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 must have been encouraging for you in the sense that you knew that. You're in Josh' memory, in, and you are, and I think you did mention that, um, in one of the, in one of your interviews that, that you're doing it for him, as well, um, in his memory, yeah. Mm, so yeah, I didn't want uh, Josh's death in vain, mm. and also when I got the closure, all right, uh, it the feeling was uh different in a sense that. The closure helped me to see things from a different perspective. It helped me to mm. see that, hey, yes, I may have lost my son, but I still have him with me because every time I share his story, I share my, you know, uh, the narrative, yeah. uh, he's there, you know, and I, I'm still a mother to him because I am his mouthpiece. Sure. He speaks ah, yes. to me. Yeah, so uh, that has given me a, a new purpose in life. Uh, not not just as a mother, but also as an individual in society mm. to, to give yeah. back. Sure. I do believe you're going to do and save many lives and really impact many, many people. In fact, that is what we are going to transition into talking about uh, advocacy for youth mental health and eradicating stigma in society. I think many people don't realize how it's a it's an undercurrent that we don't necessarily talk about in society a lot, but having having work in schools and um you know sp- talk to students and have them share their stories right it's not it's really not uncommon for them to have a friend or know somebody who has considered um taking their life before and it's something we must address we we absolutely have to address and I think part of I, for you know. MOE actually decided to have a compulsory mental health education in the starting from next year. And I think these movements that yours could have contributed to that move as well. Um, but even from a personal basis, right? Uh, I know you started to do, uh, you transitioned into stigma to strength, right? So you started initiating called stigma to strength, addressing the topic of suicide and other stigmas. And I know you share articles um, quite often what is your hope for the initiative and your intended outcome for that? Uh, the reason why um, I, you know, I, I moved into Stigma to Strength uh, as an educational initiative because, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, mm. I was looking for answers. Mm. Uh, I had a lot of questions. Okay. I didn't have the answers. Mm. Uh, and nobody could tell me the answers. So, uh, so I, I went into the research, especially on the teenage brain uh, and, you know, the, the changes in, in the teenage brain in the adolescent years and all that. Uh, for example, uh, you know, a teenager from an adolescent from the year 13 to 24, mm. um, they, it's the period where they move away from parents to peer. Mm. Uh, but then uh, because they have been raised in a family where there's the mom and the dad who have, you know, who were their attachment figures. So to move from from parents to peer, uh, that's where, 
you know, you, you move into your friends and then you also move into relationships uh, during, you know, and, and, I mean, teenagers fall in love for the first time, you know, during yeah. this period and all that. Um, actually, in, in a sense, it's, it's a change in the attachment figure in that sense. Mm. The attachment figure is no longer the parent, but it can be a, a peer, all right? Uh, so a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Uh, because I was like asking myself, why did it, you know, I mean, Josh broke, the girl broke off with him twice. Why did it hit him so hard? Um, so after I did the research, I realized that it was because he actually lost, he already lost, you know, when he moved from parent to peer, mm. uh, and you know his parents were divorced. He already lost that that attachment vigor in that sense, okay. and also because I was also in depression, uh, and because he was very close, we were very close. So when I was in depression, I couldn't really support him. Uh, so I couldn't be his pillar of support in that mm -hmm. sense. Uh, and also because he started to move from parent to peer, and he had a girlfriend. So when the girlfriend. Um, broke off with him, not once, but twice, in a span of three years. Uh, that, along with uh, the timing of the divorce, the breakup of his family and all that, I think it was just, you know, it, it was a timing. Everything was just mm -hmm. so close, one after another and all that. So so, um, so I think, you know, and, and research has shown that it can be a matter of life and death for the adolescent okay. when there's a relationship breakup. Mm. Yeah. Okay. From your research as well, is there any way that youth can guard against that? Because uh, did they do, you know, get like you said into attachment and with attachment, when the attachment is lost, naturally there is suffering. Is there any research that talks about how to guard against that drawback towards it? Um, I think where my son is concerned, I think uh, what really uh, devastated him was the way uh, the words that were spoken to him. Mm. Uh, they were very colors. And he was merely asking, you know, how are you? I miss you. But the response was so colors that when I read it myself as a mother, I... I felt the pain for him. Mm. Um, I feel that, uh, you know, relationships are very common, you know, for adolescents. Mm. But we, I think the, the, the message I want to put out is for adolescents uh, is that, yes, if it works out, fine, right? You want to get married and all that. But if it doesn't work out, you break up. But there is such a thing as responsible relationship, even in a breakup where you, you show empathy, you show compassion, even in the words you say. You know, yes, you know, you break up, but you know how painful it is, especially for the one who didn't initiate it. Yeah. Uh, and the person is already in depression. Mm. Uh, so, you know, you know there's, a, there's a saying that says, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never kill me. That's nonsense. Well, I... Yeah. Uh, I beg to differ. Yeah, it's absolute right? nonsense. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, what you say to a person in depression can mm. actually make a difference between yeah. life and death. Mm. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think I think that was really, uh, you know, already a person in depression, a young person in depression is already feeling so isolated, feeling so uh, rejected, right? Uh, by all the circumstances around him. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, he, he gets, he, he hears this. Uh, it, it, it's, it, yeah, it, it can be, it, in the case of my son, it was really the last straw on the camel's back for him. Mm. Yeah. It, it was just too painful for him. Okay. Okay. I think that's an important lesson for, for every youth that's listening or any, anybody, not just youth, right? I mean, it's not just, it's not just about you, it's every single person. We need to be careful with, with the words that we speak because they, they are like weapons, you know. They can either uplift or really tear down. 
and I think there's something that everyone can really remember and, and take back. Um, what about social media and technology? I know you, you talk about this uh, quite often. Uh, is there anything that you need to watch out for when they're navigating social media or when their self-esteem comes into play? Well, you know, if you talk about self-esteem, social media is, uh, I feel, is the number one culprit in the sense that you can't help when you get in there, you know, it's always a compare and a condemn, mm. right? You compare with others and then you feel very condemned because sure. you know, someone a nicer dress or um, a better gadget, whatever, you know, it's always a, a, sure. a compare look, you know, another person is always looking nicer, more handsome and all that. Mm-hmm. So it's, it can be actually um, very, it's not good for the self-esteem. Sure. And, and self-esteem is really the, 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 the crux of it, actually, you know, talk about depression, you know, mm. you, 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 you feel so low, yeah. that, like, you're, you know, uh, so, so I think, I think that's, uh, that's what social, you know, when one gets into social media, you have to be really careful. Uh, the second, of course, is the content uh, that, that literally, uh, you know, turns uh, the lives of children into algorithms because you mm-hmm. know that um, when you see something you right some something else pops up and it is true yeah going at it and all that mm-hmm. so for the social uh, media or tech company they only want the number of views so mm-hmm. that you know there's more money mm-hmm. but so they they become a catalyst in that sense right because, uh a, a catalyst between a vulnerable person, usually the young, and yep. the the person who you know or whatever whoever is preying on the the young mind, uh, whether it's in the form of suicide forum or in the form of uh, self harm content, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, and mm-hmm. really you know all these uh, methods and all that should not even be available on the internet because. Mm. My son literally Googled, Googled everything. Mm. And he, he learned everything. Mm. Yeah. I guess that's a draw the tough part about information or information advancement. Right? Now we have access to so much information. Literally, you can find anything online. Literally. Mm. Um, but it's hard to, to completely prevent it. I think because technology will exist and the algorithms are scary to you. Like you said, like sometimes you speak and then the thing appears on your phone. You don't know how that, that appeared. You know, you can just be talking to somebody and then suddenly the advertisement just appear on the phone. And personally, right, where there's certain times in my life where I face certain voids and I'm seeking answers, those things appear, right? Whether it's on Instagram feed, whether it's on social, on YouTube, whatever, those kinds of videos get recommended to me. Those kind of information get recommended to me. And you go into a rabbit hole uh, sometimes it's hard to get out of it. So to you, for how what uh, I would I would think that advice is really just to be aware of it, just to be aware of it and and remove yourself from that picture if you know that this is happening to you. Um. Well, the thing is that you know, in, in the case of my son, uh, one of the reasons why he went into gaming mm-hmm. is it was his way of coping. Right. Uh, he felt so much rejection in the real world. Mm. So he wanted to build his own community in the virtual world. Uh, okay. it, it's a way for him to cope. Uh, and he can still still sort of live and be him be himself. Sure. Um, but but what what is the scary part is that you know when you when you come to a stage where you don't know the difference mm. between real life and the virtual world. Yeah. So so that's the that's the thing about about you know th- there is the pros and the cons the good and the bad mm. uh, but because uh, young minds uh, their, their brains are still developing and all that so you know being easily influenced is is a high risk yeah a high risk. yeah i mean you, we've heard you know or read so many stories of young people being influenced to take their lives mm. uh, self-harm and all that you know um it's really a question of uh, some sort of level of responsibility on the part of tech companies to uh, to have you know enough technology to 
to uh, sieve out and, and to get rid of, of you mm. know, all these uh, information. Because at the end of the day, no matter how careful you are, when you are in that state, when you are in depression, you, mm. you know, you feel so low, your self-esteem is, is zilch, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can get easily influenced by a lot of things mm-hmm. on the internet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think you shared a video about Australian Prime Minister talking about a TikTok video that was circulated of someone taking their life. And he was just talking about how governments need to hold companies accountable as well. Also, on a personal basis, um, you know, have safeguards in place. I, I want to ask is, is maybe talk a little bit about parents because I know some parents are watching this listening or watching this as well is there anything parents can look out for you know when it comes to these things um okay from from my own experience talking to parents uh as well as attending Mm. forums on you know that that talk about uh social media and all that um i can safely say and i'm guilty of it because before uh my son's uh before i lost my son Mm. I would tell him usually, Josh, don't play so much on the computer. <laughs> you mm. know, uh, try and do something else. Go out, you know, have a sport, or play in a sport or whatever. Yeah. Um, and and I didn't know anything about what was going on in his virtual world. Right. Uh, yeah. And I can, I, I think a lot of parents also probably feel the same way. Mm. Uh, you know, because they have their, their yeah. headphones and yeah. then after that they're lost in that virtual world, you know, mm. and then you, you try to call them, have their meals and all that, they don't even hear you and all that. Mm. So, so this is where the friction comes in. But for, I think, parents, uh, after I lost Josh, I spoke to people in the gaming who are in gaming, mm. but what they do is that they not only play, but they look out for for uh, young people who are in depression uh, and they try to mentor them, you know? Mm. Um, and and there, are, there are lots of, uh, you know, children who are in depression who go yeah. solace and refuge in the virtual world. Um, I, I, when I started to learn about, you know, all this and, and I, I started to understand a lot of why you know young people go into computer gaming and all that, and I I told myself I said well you know I should have you know I, I wish I had learned more about all these virtual world and all that, mm. and I think how I approach you know my son would have been quite different in mm. a way I talk to him you know I I probably would be uh, born with him a lot more to yeah. understand his world. Right, so that I, I, my, my language or the way I talk to him is not always like I uh, get off the computer and, and all that. You know, a lot of confrontation between parents and, and mm. kids it happens a lot in sure. this area. <laughs> yeah, so I think for parents, uh, try and understand, you know, the more of the virtual world and what is it that uh, they that appeals to the young person. Okay. Uh, I think that sounds very sound advice or suggestion for parents for you listening to this right i do want to give a youth's perspective as well because a lot of them do ask me this question when they have friction between their parents what can they do i would always say like you know you, you could i always let kids know that whatever happens they're they're your parents and they're doing it because they mean well for you and they love you very much and that's why that's their that's their way of showing love or expressing your love it may not be the way in which you want it to, but that's how they're doing it. So what they can do youth, right, is just to understand and empathize with that, but at the same time also potentially help their parents to understand their world, you know, have mature conversations over dinner or ask over a meal, just help your parents understand why you do what you do and perhaps even direct them to videos or resources that they can watch and listen to to, uh, to understand you may not be able to express it very well but directing them to sources that someone else explains their emotions your emotions well I think that is one tool that, that has at least people have told me that they've been useful for them in uh, building their relationship with their parents 
yeah, you, you must understand that uh, they, they really love you a lot and um, as much as possible, you want to build that bridge. Uh, this is for the youth perspective. Yeah. That said, I think you also need to be very careful of the usage and your esteem when you are using uh, social media. And I, I share this a lot. Uh, and, and I guess we could wind down already and, and kind of close with some uh, one or two questions on advice for you. Is in, a, in a video, you, you shared that you like people to ask uh, why the pain instead of why the suicide. I, I found that very, like it struck me. La. It struck me that, that really struck me. Could you elaborate a little bit more about, about that? Um, yeah, because I, I, I feel that uh, people always judge the act. Mm. Why suicide, you know? Uh, when they hear a case, you know, they'll ask why, you know? Mm. They'll say things like, oh, you know, he comes yeah. from a very well-to-do family. Why? Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, what's the reason? There's no reason for him to, to actually do it, mm. right? Uh, but not knowing the family history, you know, the dynamics of the family and all that, we mm. don't know. So uh, a lot of people tend to, to sort of be judgmental uh, with the act itself. Um, so, but not understanding the pain. Because mm. my son, uh, in his suicide note, uh, he was always talking about ending the pain. He was, never talk he was never talking about ending his life. It was ending mm. the pain. Um, in my talk uh, called Delving into the Mind of a Suicidal Person, I actually give an analogy of, uh, you know, someone who, uh, is, who is just, uh, who, who's caught in, in, in a burning building, okay. you know, in, 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 on 9-11. Sure. And someone who is in depression, uh, they both actually have one thing in common, which is it's a dilemma they're going through. Uh, because if you if you describe or define dilemma, the dilemma is defined as uh, mm. being in a situation where you have to make a choice uh, among you know two or three uh, alternatives, yeah. uh, all of which are undesirable. Mm. So in a case of, of someone who is in a burning building, uh, why do they jump out? I mean, on 9-11, 200 people jumped out. Why do they jump? Right, because they couldn't bear the pain of being burned to death, right? right. Both, you know, whether you jump or you remain in the building, the result is death. But why do he was the, the person caught in a dilemma? Mm. Do I remain or do I jump? Mm. Right? Uh, so, so, in the same way, the dilemma faced by someone in depression who is suicidal is the, the torment and the torture they go through day in, day out. Right? Mm. And it was always feels like it's never ending. Yeah. Right? Uh, so, they, they feel that, yeah, I must well, I, I, I don't want to have to go through this. Mm. So I just want to end my pain. Yeah. And it's like, it's like the only option left to them at that yeah. point in time. So if you think about it, it's really about the pain. Yeah. And it's not about the act. It's sure. really to end the pain. So right. that's why I, you know, I say, don't ask why suicide, but ask why the pain. That's very, that is very, very powerful. You just shared that because I, I resonate with that so much. Like people always... I mean, I guess it's human nature that we take shortcuts and we don't want to take the effort to understand what people are going through. But for someone to imagine, like for someone to like go against their physiology to end their life, right? It must be in so much pain and devastation, both mentally, maybe physically. Um, so I think we really need to understand and, and empathize with that situation and not just look at it and just label it. You know, that, that is, uh, we can't do that. We can't do that. So, society, we need to move forward to be more inclusive and empathetic. Yeah. Yeah. In, in my talks, you know, I, I always refer, you know, people mm. always say, oh, suicide is an act of cowardice or it's a selfish act. Mm. Again, you know, is they, they zero in on the, on the act. Yeah. But I always end off by saying, you know, it's not that. 
all right? It's not even mm. a character flaw. It's not a weakness, mm. right? In as, much, as far as my son is concerned, it, it was more like he was a victim of circumstances, mm. you know? So, so I think people, you know, can afford to be less judgmental and sure. understand more, be more empath empathetic and compassionate uh, before you make a judgment you find out first what this person has gone through mm. his whole life, yeah. right? Yeah. And ask yourself whether it is painful or not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and yeah, so 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 these are the things that um, I, I I feel uh, you mm -hmm. know the, the stigma has to be reduced so that people speak in a more positive way about it. Not pos not positive to as as if to encourage it, but yeah. to really uh, understand it deeper. Sure. Okay. Yeah, let, let's hope that as you move forward in society with the education, with this being more prevalent, I'm optimistic that at least we can move forward in the society in this regard, not just for suicide, but other stigmas as, as well. And it, it is necessary. So anyone listening to this, do be kind to, to the people around you and understand not just their pain, but, but any emotion that they're facing. And that will help you and help others as well. Uh, I would just like to ask one last question before we close um, this, this podcast. Do you have anything, any encouragement or just any words to share with a person that might be going through some pain and might be considering taking their own lives? Um, I... I can only say this, uh, I know how it feels like because I've been there. Mm. I, I was suicidal once as well. Um, but there is hope. There is hope because uh, if I had acted mm. at the time when I was suicidal, um, I wouldn't be here talking. Mm. Um, so, but I didn't. And, but at that point when I didn't, I didn't know that I would ever, ever come to a place where I can share uh, having, you know, being healed of it and, and having yes. gone through it and recovered and, and doing what I'm doing right now mm. uh, to give back to society, to, to in my passion to, to, to share and save lives. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't have known at that point in time, sure. but I'm glad I didn't do it. So, so things can change mm. for the better. Yeah. Um, you just have to cling on to that hope. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Jenny, for sharing. I think with that, we have come to the end of the podcast. Um, I must also say that uh, while you were speaking, I also sensed Josh just presence. I know there's a photo of him in the background. Uh, and, and I think uh, I can sense that he's speaking through you as well, uh, just providing hope you are providing hope to a lot, a lot of people, including me as well. So I, I just really want to thank you. This is probably the most emotional podcast I've, I've done. Uh, it's really difficult to hear a story, but at the same time, I know that uh, there will be, as uh, you said, hope that comes from it. And I'm really, I'm really glad to have met you and, and spoken to you. Yeah. So... Right about the emotional part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I... I, I, I I'm, I'm glad that, uh, you know, that you gave me an opportunity to share here. Mm. Uh, I, I would take any opportunity to share because I think the word has to go out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter who the hearer is, the word mm. has to go out. Yeah. Right. Let's, let's keep in touch, Jenny. Um, for the viewers or listeners, right, you can uh, look for Jenny. Or, uh, of course, I'm going to put links to Peace Day Movement as well as stigma to strength i think those are the main platforms you can interact with a content is there any other platform or place that you would like people to connect with you or look for you if any if there's anything or any message you want to uh, yeah in general um uh well i just hope that uh you support uh, uh stigma to strength um because that is um uh, Please Stay Movement was birthed out of a season of pain and loss. Mm. Uh, stigma to Strength is birthed out of a season of purpose and hope. Mm. Yeah. 
So I hope that uh, you support uh, both uh, and, and the work that, you know, I'm, I'm doing. Uh, okay. yeah, I just, you know, I, I just very passionate. I'm just very passionate about wanting to save lives. Okay, thank you. Uh, finally, once again, uh, for, for this hour that you spent with me. And yeah, for listeners, you do subscribe if you want to attend or uh, listen to future episodes. And with that, we'll see you next time. All right. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.